These are different estimates of energy return on investment from alcohol, fuel from corn that Cutler was talking about. These are published uh, statements, but, but let's put them on a graph where the energy return on investment doesn't go from 1.6 to minus something, but in fact it goes from 0 to 50. It doesn't make any difference. This is a stupid, stupid fuel for all kinds of reasons, and I'm just getting started. <laughs> now, what are the reasons for the problems of these huge variance in different estimates that you get from lots of different peoples? Well, the first thing is you've got to talk about, as Cutler did, the, the magnitude, the possible magnitude of the fuel, not just their EROI, not, and certainly not just their economics. Um, and this is what I'm addressing here. There's not an explicit protocol for how to measure the inputs. There's often a lack of an explicit statement of assumptions, methods, and especially objectives. What are we trying to do? There's a much bigger importance of time and space than anybody talks about, um, including, which we'll look at, time series projections and with, and incidentally, you got two things fighting. There are gung-ho technological enthusiasts around here and there's gung-ho depletion enthusiasts around here. And you got to remember that these are normally fighting each other. And the result, the difference, you can't just project. It's empirical. I don't know how to do it except empirical. And most important is determining the boundaries. And we seek your uh, criticisms and contributions. We're just getting started in really trying to get this uh, standardized. Now, this is what I call a balloon graph. I showed it in Denver. I'm sorry if it's a repeat for some of you. Uh, first of all, the size of the balloon doesn't mean anything. The color is a little bit important. 1930 is blue, 1970 is purple, red is more or less today. And what I'm plotting here is energy return on investment for the United States versus, uh, I'm sorry, this is energy return on investment versus the magnitude. And the USA now produces a little more than 100 megajoules, uh, ex exajoules or quads, they're about the same, or 100% if you want, that's our fuel with a vaguely some kind of mean energy return of investment of some maybe 30 to 40 to 1. Now, over time, depletion seems to outperform technology. This is for the United States in 1930. The energy return on investment uh, was around 100 for 1 for petroleum. And it went down, that's incidentally Cutler's number, went down to about 1970 stuff we worked out together um, in about a little after 1970. And today, it's down here somewhere, um, somewhere around uh, 10 or 20 to 1. So over time, as a resource gets up, you use the best first. Uh, that's Ricardian economics. And that's really going to come home to roost for lots of things we do. Coal, as Cutler said, is probably pretty high. And it's about almost a quarter of our energy use here. Uh, natural gas, somewhere about there, we about 20% of our energy use with an energy return on investment of perhaps, uh, again, 15 or 20 for one. Um, in hydropower, Cutler had it a little bit lower. Nuclear here, uh, depending on whether you want to weight the electricity. These are all our major energy resources. And if you compare that to what we've been hearing about for the options, they're either, uh, now Cutler's latest study puts it a little bit lower, but windmills are here. Gas is it's, it's behind the black, it's way in the corner, alcohol from corn. Um, these are tiny, tiny low energy return on investments, or they're tiny in magnitude. So whatever we need is we've got to look for something in here, I think. That's really a challenge that people who look at things one at a time. Somebody has to tell me what we can generate that is over here somewhere. And if you believe in biomass, for example, here's total photosynthesis in the United States. And here is what people think might be the 
potential from forests if we don't do other things with forests. There are quantitative as well as qualitative limits to what the alternatives are. And when I look at it this way, it seems very, very scary to me. Now, one thing I've been very interested in recently is I think for a fuel to be viable for civilization, and I'm going to try to talk about this a little bit, you have to have at least something like a five for one energy return on investment. As Cutler showed quite beautifully, a fuel with a 1.5 for one is impossible to run a civilization. And for further reasons than he said, which I will try to point out. So somehow, folks, we got to get something, I guess, over here, and I don't know what it is. And I'd like anybody who has proposes an alternative to please tell me where it's going to be on this graph. Okay. Um, we found actually looking at the very wide variability in energy return on investment for corn ethanol, corn ethanol that mostly things like the amount of fuel that was used, the amount of energy for lime with one exception and so forth, there wasn't a great deal of consideration about that. Actually getting the numbers to do things is not the critical issue. And some people who have high in one category, low on the other, all kinds of um, balances out. Now, what makes the numbers, for example, for corn-based ethanol is whether you give a credit to generating also cow food or some other product uh, from from the ethanol, that's a very important issue. Um, and maybe the most important thing, and I'll come back to this, is environmentally. If you harvest the corn stalks, you can get much higher energy return on investment, or somewhat higher energy return on investments, but you're gonna run down the soils over time. And so I assume any alternative that we have has to be, in some sense, sustainable or at least not run down the system. Okay, next question. Time series of what you're dealing with. For example, the energy return on investment, and I'd like to thank Art Smith, who, uh, or just acknowledge his help on doing this too, um, is we're trying to do energy return on investment for global oil and gas. And if we are to believe these numbers, the important thing is not that we're getting somewhere around 25 barrels back for a barrel invested in finding it, but that if we can extrapolate this, we did it linearly, we have no idea what that future uh, curve might look like. Um, this indicates that it doesn't matter how much oil you find, by somewhere in a decade or two, it'll take you a barrel of oil to get the next barrel of oil out of the ground. It is no longer a fuel. So time and time series is an important issue here. Another important thing, this is David Murphy's work, is to look at the energy return on investment for ethanol. Ethanol makes a certain amount of sense if you want to have a 1.4 or so energy return on investment if you go to the very best place to grow corn in the United States. But if you go to inferior places, it's an energy sink. This is from USDA numbers. Uh, probably a sink in California because we haven't included irrigation yet in this. But the idea is, in a Ricardian sense, there's a best place to get each of your resources. We we're talking about this in lunch in terms of tar sands. And as you go progressively away from your best resource that you exploit first, then the energy cost goes up, which may or may not be countered by technology. Um, <clears throat> the most important thing is the conceptual boundaries. Let's start with uh, energy output. Do you do it at the Earth's surface? Um, in other words, is your energy return on investment done when the oil comes out of the ground here? Do you do it at the refinery and after you've used another 10 or so percent? to upgrade this from crude oil to gasoline or something you can use, or at the gas pump. These are, will affect the energy return on investment and make them all smaller. Um, trying to summarize all this information, 
Uh, this, the, the degree of blue depends on how well accepted the concept is. Everybody says we got to include the direct energy, energy used on site. Almost everybody says we have to use the indirect energy, the energy to make the steel, to fly the workers out to the platform and so forth. Probably increasingly people agree that we have to have some kind of energy assessment of environmental impact or perhaps we should say compensating for environmental destruction. More controversial, do we have to include the energy to support the labor? Well, economists say that's consumption. But maybe this is just as essential as is this to make this, to get that oil out of the ground. And finally, somebody that nobody, something nobody considers except, to my knowledge, me, is to, should we use the energy to use the energy? We don't want energy, we want energy services. So should we include in our EROI the energy to make and maintain the highways and the trucks? That's why energy from something like ethanol, corn ethanol, at least in current technologies, cannot possibly work because the thing is hugely subsidized by fossil fuel. So how do we think about putting this all together? Uh, here's just a thing on environmental cost. This is left over from uh, the southern Louisiana, <clears throat> left over from exploiting oil in 1930s. Um, that's five miles across there. That used to be marsh. Marsh is friction, slowed hurricanes. If you take the estimates of repairing the damage to our infrastructure from hurricanes Katrina and uh, Rita, it was at some proportion of which was larger because this ecosystem was no longer there to slow down the hurricane, then that represents three or four percent of U.S. remaining oil reserves for that repair. Should that be subtracted from the energy cost or added to the energy cost of extracting oil? Uh, I think, yes, we cannot afford to run our ecosystems down. Um, <clears throat> If you increase your boundaries from direct and indirect, add environment, add labor, uh, add infrastructure. Just in the example of EROI from corn, here being one for one, break even. So here are the ones that are positive, but as you add in more of the boundary issues, and we don't really know what these are, your energy return on investment goes down and down and down. And I think we have to use large, uh, large boundaries. So we have, we have protocols that we suggest. You have to do it objectively with hypotheses. Almost all EROI numbers that are out there are from somebody who's trying to make a case one way or the other. We gotta get rid of that. I don't know how we do that but we have to have some agreed upon protocol. You have to use working technologies. I've heard a lot about cellulosic ethanol. Nobody knows how to break the binds in cellulose. All my forestry friends say, I don't know how to do it. We can't do it. We can't do it yet. I can maybe do it in, a, in, a, in the laboratory, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> I think we should do it for the point of final demand. Include all these things that I've talked about. Uh, state your objectives. That's pretty easy. Talk about the substance, as Cutler was talking about, the quality of the product that you're doing. Be explicit about where the output is being measured. Um, energy units input is easy, more or less, except there's different qualities of all of the fuels that you have coming out. Uh, I'm sorry, this is uh, uh, inputs. You can convert dollars to um, amount of energy used approximately. We need a lot more work on that. Uh, and output's a lot easier. And I end with the need for having something like this. I don't pretend I'm the one who do this or necessarily knows, but we have to have where everybody says, yes, I use this value. Yes, I use this value. Uh, yes, I included this or no, I didn't include this. Uh, I did or didn't include each of these things in order to determine their energy return on investment. And then finally, I will have some sense about what's a good fuel for the future. Because listening to everything for these two days, I don't. Bye. <clears throat>